Hello, everyone. Hi. Hey. Well, welcome to my talk called uh, Moving the Needle in User Research Toward Theme of Production. Uh, we're going to be covering today a case study in uh, PVZ Garden Warfare. And just to get to know each other a little bit, I'll do my part. And my name is Veronica Zamido. I'm a lead researcher at Electronic Arts, which is one of the amazing aspects of working at EA, is the great portfolio. So I've been working on different franchises, including Battlefield, NHL, FIFA, Madden, among other titles. So keep it very exciting. My background is in psychology and HCI. Uh, game studies is exactly where, where I fit. So now that you know where I'm coming from, uh, let's jump in right away to what it says. I bet that all of you are very familiar with this mantra, test early, test often, which is fantastic. It's good. You should really do it. However, every project gets to the last stretch of production. You have that game. It's there. You are committed. It's looking good, but there are still some gaps in there. And those core game mechanics are good, but that final shape needs to be fleshed out a little bit more. And that's exactly what's going to happen. It's about moving that needle more and more and more. It's about asking, how can we go from good to great? There are specific challenges near the end of production. And things to really, really keep in mind is there is no time for radical changes. You're pretty much committed. So the use of research that is going to happen at this stage is going to be primarily about fine-tuning that gameplay. For doing that, you need to deconstruct problem areas. And with that, I mean exactly to pass it like a fine-toothed comb through the game mechanics, through the different game elements. That deconstruction is, is going to require some time different methodologies, and metrics are going to be your, your best friend for this. And don't be afraid about changing focus. Right now, the point number one says there is no time. You need to actually prioritize and find those weak spots. So focus sometimes can pivot from one area to another one based on the player's feedback. To actually ex exemplify a little bit more about this distinction between earlier stages, pre-pro, towards later in production, the goals are going to be different. User research is going to be done throughout, but the needs are going to change. Early in the stages are going to be more about those core game mechanics and, and user flow and usability, that sort of thing that you really care to wipe out of the board at that time, where later, common things that you really want to do are related to progression, the fine tuning, and balancing. They are different techniques, so you'll be using different tools to achieve this. One on one and think aloud are, are great for earlier stages where are later in the, in the game development, you really want to go more questionnaires and telemetry, and the data is going to be different, so it has to be treated slightly different. What I want to really point out here is about the affective and behavioral data. With affective, I mean everything related to feelings, emotions, attitudes, things that are really hard to measure. And behavioral at this point of the development process, I do mean the in-game actions that players are doing. There is a plethora, actually, of different techniques. I just took those that are more relevant, that the ones that are like the bread and butter that you really want to use, uh, but there are more. And you will be cherry-picking at different stages, depending on the study that you have at hand, to use one of this. Um, 
not going to go over all of it because that would be a, a talk by itself. But I really wanted to point out those in red, which are, as I mentioned, the bread and butter of things that you really want to use towards the end of production. Notice that those are also more on the quantitative side because at this stage, you want to be absolutely positive that you have a good sustain of number of people that are indicating that you're making that progress. And also quantifying these data is going to allow you to have those metrics to push that needle. The whole objective subjective is more towards if I ask you from one to five, how fun was this game? And you give me a number, it was super fun, it was five. And, and that's the quantifying part, but it's still subjective, but you cannot challenge that. So off we go with these techniques. Telemetry is not going to pop up right away at the end of production. You should have been planning for that. The researchers and designers should have discussed earlier about which ones, uh, what telemetry that you really want to, to track. So now that you have that framework of different tools that you really want to use and how you want to apply them, let's go to plants versus zombies, garden warfare. And I want to play two very short clips. So plants versus zombies, garden warfare was bringing a known brown into the shooter genre. PVZ garden warfare took the traditional beloved tower defense game, and turn it into a third-person shooter. The goal is, was to immerse that player into uh, the world of plants and zombies, the, the fighting and the battle in suburbia. And it was designed for fans of action shooter games. And also it was aspirational for kids. Even though that was not necessarily the primary audience, accessibility was a key aspect of the design. So I'm going now to show you an out from the zombie side. This one is a clip from the game mode, uh, Gardens and Graveyards. So here the zombie trying to capture the garden, transform it into the graveyard. And I'm going to uh, follow up with this specific game mode as an example. So it's pretty fun, very colorful. You have all the shooter mechanics, but really stripped down to the very, very essence. And boom. So PVC was developed over uh, two years. It started from February 2012 to February 2014. Key questions that we need to keep brushing by the end were more related to character robustness, maps and faction balance, and progression. Progression from just unlocking your abilities to actually level up and have that long-term engagement. So the part that I really want to focus on and share those examples are actually for the six last months of production. And I noticed that we were testing even until February 2014, so even two weeks be before it was launched, we were still testing and doing that fine tuning because even though it wasn't necessarily in the it was already produced, but it was possible to at least do even more changes and keep pushing that for the day one patch. <clears throat> so the user research goals that I want to focus on today that were key for this were uh, assessing the map perception and usage, ensuring the balancing of factions, and, and validating the character's playability and experience. There were many, many sessions done. This one shows you the, the typical setup that was used for those. From a design perspective of the study was a mixed method, mixing this quantitative and qualitative data. The key tools that I told you that now you know are instrumental questionnaire was excellent for this part to collect all these effective and behavioral data. And there were many different sessions, and for all those sessions, we're running between 24 and 48 people per uh, study, and sessions were ranging from two, uh, four hours to two full days. 
Uh, now, here's an example of uh, one of the maps, Garden and Graveyard, is a 24 players map, bringing people in, making them play, and collecting that data. So, going specific to the Gardens and Graveyard, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a mode with an expanding map. If you play Battlefield, it's like a rush mode, where you have those zombies will be in the attacker and plants will be defending. There will be a timer. If the timer if it runs out and the zombies couldn't, couldn't invade, zombies, uh, plants win. However, if the zombies transform the guard into the graveyard before the timer, another part of the map opens. This one is the map especially for the coastal map that has five different sub-maps. I mentioned to you that you want to define very clear metrics about what you want to do. And, and this one were the metrics that we found the most useful for measuring your maps and really what you want to change about them. So it were regarding the, the map size, the amount of cover, can you cover from the incoming damage, uh, population, how crowded or empty does it feel? Uh, the visual appeal as well is very important. Respawning, if people were perceiving that they could go back to the action quickly enough or not. And overall navigation, PVZ doesn't have a mini map, doesn't have a map, it's just off you go. So that was also really important to tackle. To give you an example, there were um, many questions were using this scale type of questions, one to five. In this case, with example about the, the map size from way too small to way too big and a clear definition about it was the right spot, that sweetness that you wanted to get with the participants. It was, some of the, the most were coming really good. In the maps, you see that everything is between 70 and 80% of people were actually uh, thinking that it was very, very good. There were some minor tweakings that needed to be done, but it, it was coming along. We did that the same exercise for all those different metrics, so we knew exactly which one we are, and that was exactly about deciding to prioritize which one you're going to be touching because there's no time, you need to prioritize uberly important. So from all those, we did some minor tweakings for the amount of cover from the Zombos Mountain and also the respawning locations in the castle map. But you really want to triangulate multiple data. And here we have another angle from where to address if is the map actually working properly from a player's perspective. So they were given all the different maps that they play and they had to rank it from most preferred to least preferred and from the most fun to the least fun. The, actually those rankings were perfectly overlapping to each other which is uh, good Sometimes they have, people have different reasons other than fun to prefer something. And I'm not sure Marina was coming out really good. All of the comments were primarily positive. And we need to make some changes. We cannot cover all, or sometimes not everything needs to be tweaked. And clearly the problem was with the, with the pirate ships. Actually a third of participants ranked that one as the least fun and the least preferred. As you notice on the comments, the themes that were emerging is that they were dying quite easily. Complementing data from, I, I mentioned, you want to attack for different angles and really, really understand. Now we know from the quantitative side that where the problem is effective, now we need to know exactly why. So here you have this aerial screenshot of the pirate ship map. The design intention of this map was to recreate a pirate battle. It was about creating this tension of warding each other factions. The zombies start from the bottom of the screen and the plants have the garden on the top. So both factions will be reaching the, the two ships and then they'll roar and board each other. It was like, it sounded awesome at the time. It was like, yes. Uh, however, it was a map that was highly disliked. We were shown that screenshot to the players 
There were many other screenshots predefined for having a, a really good view of, of the map and also for all the maps, but particularly for this one, which was the problematic. This is a heat map, but this is a heat map generated by the users clicking on the image saying which one were their least preferred locations. As you see, it was primarily related to those unintended deaths. The shoreline was not clear that you couldn't really walk into the water, but if you look at it, it, it looks inviting. Like maybe there's another angle to go around, but really it was pretty much instant death if you step into the water. Which a heat map which has deaths, it would have been different because there were many, many other deaths of people killing each other in other parts of the maps. So this one was for a really good gathering of visually understanding what part of the map were not really working and getting all the qualitative open question comments about why it was not really working. So this, and in the middle as well, this boarding each other idea didn't work at all. It became more like walking off the plank kind of idea, which is very sad. So after each session, we'll get together with the design team and analyze the data and what they did. We're immediately jumping on and doing some changes. So introducing new elements on the map to clearly indicate that not, this is not a path, this is the creation, you need to go to the other way. Uh, the distance on the ships also tweak a little bit more so it will be less likely that you will accidentally fall. Uh, the crack of the engineer is love for everyone, so that's why I choose that screenshot. And, and all those changes actually were really good, and uh, we always also look at the critics when it comes out to see what we missed, what we didn't, and what was actually picked up by them. So that was actually uh, working really well. Now, changing to the balancing of factions, having two roles of attacking and defenders is not necessarily the easiest way of measuring fairness of these two distinctions. A team deathmatch mode would be cleaner to see if they are, these two factions are perfectly balanced, but the roles actually, they do tint a lot because we knew that the roles were, the characters had the same abilities on, on both modes, but in this one was being more problematic and the perception was being different. So it didn't happen if the telemetry will show that the outputs of damage were the same, people were seen differently. And actually that was one of the common topics that were coming why that mode was, what was the detrimental part of fun, and it was that perceived unfairness, even though it was fair for the character. So also retouching it slightly, some of the health and outputs and weapon for the specific mode to actually translate that. And actually that one picked up as well. So we're like, good, happy about that. The, the, the last part of the, the, the I wanted to share with you today was about the characters. And there are eight, eight core characters for perfection. And we went over a similar exercise of deconstructing these characters. And for that, it was more about fun, strength, health, and abilities. There were also a lot of questions about if you were a zombie, how were you perceiving plants? And if you were a plant, how you were perceiving zombies, which was very uh, insightful as well. Doing a similar exercise with uh, ranking the characters, we can find that the Chomper, which was very unique, is a very distinctive character for, for a shooter game where you can have Boro and then he jumps from underneath and then he has a one hit kill. So it was pretty novel and surprising. I was ranking very well about contributing towards this fun. And then the, the foot soldier and pea shooter, more of the archetypical shooter characters were ranking very well, like excellent. But so our problem is the sunflower. And sure, the sunflower is a healer. If you look at the distribution of classes and preferences, healers is not the majority, of course. But we also look into uh, have different people, those who identify themselves as healers and those who actually are not healers. Um, from the two different demographics, the sunflower was coming, coming low. So again, pivoting, let's just focus on the sunflower and this one is the one that we need to focus on, on help. 
there were uh, a lot of little tweaks, primarily on, on the back end of the sunflower. And here you have all the different abilities that she has. And notice that allowing us to get that uh, metrics were very informal to actually see if we're actually increasing and moving that needle with this character. And, and it was, it was coming well-rounded and better. Similar exercise with all the other characters, but this one was the, most, the one that needed the more urgency. After that exercise, you would say like, we nail it, characters, boom, done. Uh, but actually not, because we got the basic all eight core characters, but each character has actually there are six of each type. So they are like six pea shooters, six foot soldier, six sunflowers, blah, 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 and that's a lot, and the total sum is 48. When we were ranking all the characters, everyone was playing all the classes. That's why people were able to rank them. But imagine that a session where you have enough time to play with all 48 characters would be pretty much close to impossible. So for that, adjusting the methodology to make it fit. So instead of having this ranking, and even in the ranking, you really don't know how much of a gap there is with preferred top one to the last one. It's like double, it's middle, it's close to close. There was no difference between first rank and second rank. So a, a constant sum type of questions uh, allows you to have multiple people intersubject for those of you doing the, the research side that you can compare them better. And there was a section for each type of character, and then we could also look at all the 48 characters at once and actually identify which one from the full soldier family, which one we should consider making changes, and then from the whole 48 characters, which one should we focus to make those changes. In this example is for the, for the foot for the foot soldier, actually the Arctic Trooper was, was the, most, the one a little bit more damaged. There was a lot of variability, but it was still kind of clear the reasoning why. And as an Arctic soldier, it throws ice and you're supposed to freeze, and that wasn't very clear. The visual cues were not indicating that people were freezing their enemies. The, the balance between freezing and how much output damage you can do, it was also not well-balanced and being felt as, as fair. Again, picking up, it was pretty good that uh, at the end, once all the critics get it, it was this diversity that you could control, it was pretty good. So we were happy about that. And now that I mentioned a lot of different specific metrics and this construction from the different game elements, we also have some metrics that are going overall. And those more game element metrics are awesome for the game designer, but also for management, producer, executive producers, they like to have these overarching metrics as well. So I have to do a combination of both. And uh, this one, we're more looking at motivation, engagement, and enjoyment of the game. And also we can see how all those changes, how they were affecting the overall enjoyment and comparing from September to December sessions. And it was constant across the multiple game modes and for how many hours people have been playing the game. So that was a really good indication. I, I would really move in the needle. Yes, no. And here we have proof of how the impact of those changes were happening. Now, the, the second moving the needle part is uh, we also track in a single metric about how well this game is performing. And this one to 10 actually resembles a lot to the Metacritic. And regardless if Metacritic is a fair assessment of a game or how successful it is, it's a really good parameter. And early, early on, it was in a 6.8 average, so it would be a 68. Later on, it was getting more towards the end, so in 0.3. And actually, the Metacritic score ended up being 76. So these are like kind of all those little pushes, all that fine tuning that you want to get to something. And we were pretty excited that we were showing that improvement of how it would be translated to the public. Now you ask me, 
76. Like, are you happy with that? Uh, well, no, it's 76. You generally want to at least break in the 80. So on the one hand, no, no, really happy with that. On the other hand, we also did that discussion about, well, shoot, if it was, everything was going so well, what was missing? And what makes me happy, at least because of why that 76, is that the core design intentions were there. All the trees picked up on those and actually call it about PVZ, being in the shooter world, refreshing the genre, making it more fun, more accessible, classic humor, and it was there. But things that backfire were about gradual content and game as a service. When it was launched, it wasn't, all, not all the game modes were there, not all the DLC and maps that were actually coming for free down the road uh, were not really perceived by anyone, not for the players, because that was still being discussed, and not from the people who on day one saw the game and, and played it. And that might have been a different strategy that has, should have been in place to surface that within the game. So actually, that the part of the backfire were more like uh, other components that do change the perception, but actually those core game mechanics that were really fleshed out were really well. Uh, fair enough, I'll take the 76. And even though that got lower to 70, it, it was still within what the game was meant to be. So, Wrapping all this up, main takeaways about the last stage of production was the no radical changes. You are committed. You know that you have something good, so make it better now. Make your priorities, fine tune the hell out of it. Deconstruct everything. There is no time to say if it was meant something or the other. You really want to design that methodology. I share with you different examples of how those different type of questions can help you to understand from different angles people's answers and combine them. The repeated measures, the whole longitudinal study as well. And you really want larger samples. Like even with 24, without even, not even going big data, but with 24, you still, you still feel more confident. And because you are repeating that through time, you're also reinforcing and know where are you going. And, and focus on the weak spot. Uh, don't fear pivoting from a, one aspect to the other. As I show you in the maps, there were some problems on those core metrics, but actually the, the big, big problem came from another question, and we focused primarily on those, combining those emotional responses and what people were having. And, and that is it. So thank you so much. And if you have questions, there are two, three mics over there. I'm happy to answer any question that you may have. Thanks.